slightly delayed start and more panelists will join us, but we'll have a very fully charged morning discussion. And thanks for joining us so early in the morning and uh, right before the prime, uh, Premier's speech. But we're talking about a very exciting topic, the scaling up of electric mobility. In 2017, if I can share with you, the global sales of electric cars crossed the threshold of 1 million units. And if you look at China, where we're in, China holds more than half of global sales and also the largest electric car stock in the global total, which we call the double 50%. We cross both thresholds. And these numbers are exciting, but what's behind it is the policy incentives, availability of infrastructure, industry innovation, public buyers' enthusiasm, and most importantly, what's lying ahead? When the invisible hand, we replace the visible hand and take it from there and move the market more driven by demand rather than the policy incentives. We have a super panel to discuss with that today. Some are still on the way and some distinguished guests are already here. Let me introduce very briefly to you, start from the gentleman on my right side, Mr. Wang Gang, who needs very little introduction. Currently the president of China Association for Science and Technology and chairman of China's Zhigong Party. And as we all know, former minister of science and technology for 11 years. And probably, if I can share an anecdote, back in 2013, he's probably the first minister to drive an EV to a <laughs> two session to the National Party's the Congress. The first minister developed that. The first EV and the drive. And drive it, <laughs> exactly. And um, also, the gentleman on the, again, right-hand side is Mr. Francois Provost, and uh, the chairman of group uh, of Renault Asia Pacific Region and CEO of Dongfeng Renault Autonom Autonomy, uh, Autom Automotive Company. So let's start it with Mr. Wan first. Share with us, please, the path of chi how China develops the EV and leapfrog so quickly. Uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very delighted to be here to meet all of you. I want to start by thanking all of you for your passion and trust into the electric vehicles development. I want to share with you three points. First, a brief review of China's history of uh, EV market development. Back in 2001, I just returned from Germany and uh, interested by the Ministry of Science and Technology of China. I began to serve as the chief scientist for China's EV sector. I was the among the first to champion the R&D for EVs in China. And the reason we started to develop EV is because we want to reduce energy footprint, control air pollution, and also stimulate innovative development of the automotive industry as a whole. So back then, we mapped out our strategy to include PEV, HEV, and uh, uh, fuel cell electric vehicle. We also made plannings for uh, power and electric control system as the core technology priorities. So 10 years later, in 2011, after China successfully held the 2008 Olympic Games and also the Shanghai Expo, we tested the market and uh, begin to roll out EVs in the public transport sector. As of last year, China already sold 779,000 units of EV. The total car park has reached 1.46 of 1.46 million units, accounting for half of the global total. So in the first half of this year, China already sold 600,000 units of EV, which means China's total car park of EVs reached over 2 million units, which means we can save about 10 million tons of oil 
and helping us re reduce uh, pollutants discharge and uh, carbon emission. So I think we are well on the path to realize our goals set out in the beginning. I also want to share with you our future perspective. In recent years, starting with the Nordic countries and uh, also European countries, Japan and uh, India, some of the neighbor, neighboring countries uh, also formulated plannings for EV. And uh, I have been closely following some of the industry leaders, including Volkswagen, BMW, uh, Mercedes-Benz, and Renault, and also a GM. Those industry leaders also have identified very specific plans for EV development in the future. In my view, the new energy vehicle development in China represents an opportunity for us to upgrade our industry and also an opportunity for China to tackle air pollution. So based on our experience, we need to continuously strengthen the short gaps. One of the major weaknesses of EV is the range challenge. And uh, maybe in the future, we can leverage the application of hydrogen uh, motor to extend the range of EVs. The second priority is to enhance quality, including the energy intensity, uh, energy and power density, specific energy, specific power, and also control system, including telematics and uh, smart vehicles. The third point is to enhance China's infrastructure, including charging posts and uh, hydrogen refilling stations and infrastructures, and also uh, innovation capacity, safe operation, the uh, scaling up of business models. Those are the challenges we can help resolve with constant innovations in the age of the internet. Another major issue on people's minds is to optimize our policy environment. Starting from 2010, the Chinese government formulated policies targeting at NEV providing financial subsidies to new energy vehicles based on the size of the and capacity of the uh, batteries. And uh, starting from last year, the government began to exit and retire some of the subsidy policies. And we have adopted an incremental approach for EVs who have already achieved market success. We can speed up the process of exit. But for fuel cell EVs, they may continue continuously depend on government financial support. And uh, starting from this year, we also implemented the new energy vehicle credit system and a carbon trade scheme to supplement the overall policy framework. And also, we will innovate the arrangement of right of way and uh, access to road. For example, in Beijing, the uh, conventional vehicles uh, are banned from hitting the road at least for one day per week. But uh, there was no such restriction for EVs. So electric vehicles will enjoy better access to road. Many other cities in China are also following the step of Beijing. And also in the age of uh, the internet and uh, digitalization, we also pay attention to innovating our business model. For example, car sharing is a major trend going forward. And uh, we already have uh, car hailing apps on people's smartphones. And uh, also, we are seeing efforts to promote autonomous driving. 
these new uh, innovations will certainly enhance the efficiency of uh, vehicle uses. And the third point I want to share with you is that the market needs to stay open and uh, even open wider to the outside world. This year, uh, during the opening ceremony, President Xi Jinping made an important speech at Boao Forum, stressing the importance of opening up further to the outside world. And uh, the automotive, automotive sector is one of the major areas for China to open up. And the State Council also followed up with corresponding measures to facilitate uh, opening up. Uh, last year, China hosted the eighth Clean Energy Ministerial meeting with participation from over 30 countries. And uh, the conference adopted a decision that by 2030, uh, new energy vehicles sales should account for at least 30% of the total sales. So that's the so-called 30-30 target, 30% of EVs in uh, new car sales by 2030. So uh, governments need to follow up with standard making and the policy making and legislation to allow us to attain that target. So I think in all, uh, thanks to the vigorous efforts in the past years, new energy vehicles and EVs will serve as major measures for us to transform the sector. Smart vehicle, electric vehicle, really represent the future technology trends and directions. So I sincerely hope all of you, I see many familiar faces here. Some of you are from the auto industry, others are from the investment community, and still some are from the R&D community and uh, small and uh, medium-sized enterprises. We need collaborative efforts to promote NEV to live up to the expectation of addressing air pollution and uh, industry upgrading. Thank you. Touched a lot of uh, uh, grounds and also set up a, a very good start. And we'll come back to some of the points later, including the policy incentives and the market opening. But let's uh, switch to Francois and some of the men, uh, some of the parts that uh, uh, Mr. Wan mentioned actually will affect your business. Um, like the market opening, you will plan to, what, how do you see the Chinese market? And as the leading EV provider of the globe, uh, uh, the leading global EV provider, how do you compare the China market to, let's say, European market? Yes, thank you. Um, first table, more or less everywhere in the world, the key success factor for quick EV ramp up are the same. And the first uh, important point is a strong government policy. And for sure, it is the case in China, as explained by, by Mr. Wan. So it means um, uh, not only uh, subsidies, because we speak a lot of subsidies, but uh, strong regulation in terms of emission. And today, Chinese regulation is uh, uh, most severe in the world. But also uh, uh, infrastructure. Uh, uh, without infrastructure, the quick EV ramp up is impossible. So uh, in, in China, the plan is to have about 5 million posts uh, by 2020. And uh, non-monetary uh, um, regulations, such as uh, free access to city, uh, free parking, or uh, access to uh, a bus line, for instance. So when you have this comprehensive uh, scheme of uh, policies, you have a very quick EV ramp up. It is the case in, in China already, especially in some cities. Uh, in Europe, you take the case of Norway, about 30% of the market already uh, full uh, electric uh, vehicle. So this is uh, the global scheme. And for sure, as uh, China puts this as a strong priority and is doing this with a very comprehensive and global approach, uh, the, the, the ramp up will go uh, very quickly. In terms of uh, differences between uh, uh, China and, and Europe, uh, maybe three. Uh, first one is um, Chinese policy is uh, uh, unified 
In Europe, we have many, many policies depending on the countries. In China, it's very much unified nationally. Of course, there is some <coughs> local policy on top. Uh, so this is a strong point. The second is about the customer. Mm -hmm. China is mainly uh, first buyer customers compared with a mature market like in Europe. So it means that in China, even if the car is electric car, um, customer is quite price sensitive. So it means it's even tougher uh, for OEM uh, to convince customer to go to EV if there is no plate limitation and so on, uh, because the customer will, will look firstly to the, to the price of the car. It's also why uh, subsidies is also very important. <laughs> On, on the contrary, Europe is let's more mature market for automotive. So people understand uh, what we call TCO, total cost of ownership. And of course, you can pay little more the car itself because afterwards, the usage of the car is very cheap. The, the feeling of electricity is much cheaper than gasoline. And the maintenance of an electric car is minus 40% compared with a normal IC car. So this is second, second differences. And the third one, maybe about the industry itself. Um, in Europe, electric market is uh, managed by traditional OEMs. For instance, uh, Renault, we have 20% mm -hmm. of market share in Europe. And in China, we see uh, a lot of new companies, uh, startups, uh, willing to do breakthrough uh, with uh, electric cars. So this is uh, interesting to see what will happen in China. And for sure, I completely agree with Mr. Wan that China is already the biggest market in the world and will keep leadership in terms of volume, but also in terms of technologies in China. And this is why we strongly invest in China, especially with our partner Dongfeng, in order to develop a full range of electric cars. Thank you. And, and thanks for uh, also the two participants who joined us now on the stage. Uh, Eric um, Xing Luo, Luo Xing, Chief Executive Officer of GCL System Integration Technology, good to see you again. And also our Karsten um, Britfeld, <laughs> CEO of Byton. <laughs> and before that, of course, the veteran of BMW and also the father of i8, luxury plugging, hybrid model. And our last but not least, uh, Depender Saluja, who broke, ty uh, broke Typhoon, Typhoon to uh, come and join us today, got <laughs> delayed by Typhoon a little bit. He's the partner and managing principal of Capricorn Investment. So um, welcome, gentlemen. And also, let's continue our discussion on uh, how you see the Chinese uh, market and also put that into the global perspective. So let's just directly jump to our probably Karsten. Um, Tell us what the EV technology development that most excites you, because now you are completing the new company after so many years at the BMW, the mature one. Yeah, good morning, everyone. Thank you for having me here. Um, I have to apologize first for being a bit late. The reason is that the traffic situation has been very much different than expected. <laughs> it was a disaster, which leads me directly to the business model of Python, <laughs> uh, because we want to be... Uh, we are a startup um, for smart mobility solutions in the future. Traffic cannot go on like it is today. And this is what, what we are working on on, on, a, on a very generous scope. Mm -hmm. Now coming back to a question, what, what is Byton? Um, you might ask, does it make sense to create another company building and selling electric cars? <coughs> and uh, the, the clear answer is no. There are so many cars com companies out, very great players. They all will be able to build and sell electric cars. But what's happening right now, it goes much beyond being electric. Electric is something which, which will happen. There are some requirements to do. The, the, we need more products, cheaper products. Quality has to be higher. There has to be some infrastructure built. All, all the things which I already mentioned. But this is on the way. You, you can buy electric cars today with a range of 500 kilometers, which gives you everything you, you want. They might be a bit too expensive, uh, but this, this is under development. The real development, what we see, uh, is um, something different. We see technology trends coming up, like, um, like being smart, so high-speed connectivity, and intelligence, which, which leads to autonomous driving. And this not only will lead to complete different products in, for those objects we called cars before, but it will lead to complete different business models. 
And this is a real chance for, for, for new companies because, again, sell, building and selling electric cars, there are many companies out who can do this. But to uh, come up with a complete new business model is much more difficult if, you're working, if, you, if you have a company with 100,000 or 200,000 employees today. So, Biden's intent is to create the first smart device on wheels. And this will be a car, yes, it will be an electric car, but the real thing is that we will create a complete new user experience and that we will use the car as a, as a platform to make business with our customers. And this business will be based on digital services, on data, and eventually it will become a <coughs> provider of shared mobility. And this is a real chance because shared mobility will solve a lot of issues for, not only for customers but for societies. Societies has, have two uh, ch uh, challenges today. One is pollution and sustainability, and I think we, mm -hmm. we, we know this in China very well. Mm -hmm. The other point is uh, there are too many cars out there. They are, they, are, they, are, they are using too much space in the street and parking and so on and so forth. So there's no alternative to come up with a shared uh, economy and shared mobility approach. You need the right products and the right business <coughs> models for doing so, and this is why we founded Biden. Exciting. And uh, we'll come back to the technology later, but now let's shift to Eric. And um, you provide solutions in a lot of scenarios and represent the Chinese companies. So how do you see the EV market here? And since we were both at a green BRI session yesterday, there's one uh, argument that saying the EV is not as green as it looks. So it, there might be less, pollu that less emission, but there will be pollution coming out of the electricity it generates. So how do you see, how do you address the green issue of that? Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Uh, here we are talking about e-mobility. You can see how critical it is. Uh, three out of five panelists are late because of the traffic. It took me one hour. I'm very sorry. <laughs> so as Mr. Wang is an is instrument leader for the China uh, EV China mobility, so I'm not going to get into that details. But uh, GCR is a is an energy company. We are the number one non-state-owned energy company. We own 40 gigawatt the power, including most of the new energy power. We will have over 400 power plants globally. So I try to offer a different perspective uh, from an energy company how we think the e-mobility or EV, what it is, what it is, and what kind of solution we, we have. Uh, as you know, the power, the energy is the revolution from the traditional energy, uh, fossil fuel, fixed energy to the distribution. Now it's moving to the mobile power business. So we believe the e-mobility, the essential part is that how you manage the mobile power. Mobile power means First, it has to be clean. Second is where you need, when you need, how you get the power. So that's our solutions. We believe the car, make car is easy, particularly make the EV car, it's, it's very easy. But how you manage the life cycle of the battery, okay? Increase the density of the power, cru the cruise speed, and also most important, how you get a charging the power, where you get the power, how you can make the power competitive, and eventually, what do you do with this recycle battery? Okay, that's GCR is offering. We provide the total solution we call power management. Yeah. I say make the car, it's, it's, very, it's, it's not part, it's less complicated than the traditional car. So what we are doing right now, uh, we, first we are working with the SoftBank in India. First we try to electrify the tri-bicycle. Right, the Ola. Ola is the share service of India. SoftBank has a majority shareholder. So we provide a total solution for the tri-bicycle. That's, that's our pilot program. It's mm -hmm. soft energy the program. Then now in China, we signed multiple license with Jiangsu, with Henan, with Zhengzhou. We call Electrify City, okay? Number one, because I said we have over 400 power plant. How we get our power to the charging port, okay? We don't like to sell the power to the Chinese state grid. It's a very, very low, low price, right? If you sell to the charging power, you get five, six times of the price, right? Number two, how we build a charging station. Right now, if you look at the charging station, for the independent charging station owner, it's very difficult to survive because they need to buy the power, they need to lease the network, then they have to figure out how to sell the power, to whom. So our solution is we control the pack. 
Now we are making the pack. Of, uh, we, we don't make the battery, we buy the battery, we make the pack, and we use the big data and the clouding, we control the pack systems. We, mm -hmm. And the pack is belong to us. The car is belong to the driver, but the pack, the battery is belong to us. So we try to control where you charge, how you charge, and what's the cycle. Number one is the cost. Number two, we want to sell the power. Number three, we want to monitoring the life of your battery so we decide when we can retire battery to make the storage because we own significant power plant globally. But essentially, the renewable energy is in, solar wind is intimate power, but how you make the power more constant to resolve some of the issues of curtailment and all these different the storage is part of the solution. That's why we have the complete cycle we call power solutions for the EV. What we believe, only you solve this big problem, then EV can be increased exponentially. Then back to your carbon solutions, that's, that's another question is how you can better utilize the power. Because when you retire the EV, everyone knows you still have 80% of the battery. So what do you do with that? You throw away. I think the, industry, the Minister of Industrial Technology just made a regulation. Who sells the pack? Who has to recycle the power? Recycle the battery. That's become the big trend for. That's the GCR solutions. For we, car and the battery is different. It's separate. We make it easy and make it simple. Then we manage the entire power. From where you get the power, how you distribute power, how you charge the power, how you manage the battery, how you recycle the battery, eventually has a total eco, we call eco, uh, environment for the total EV solutions. Thank you. It's very important, the entire life cycle of that and the eco environment. Yeah. And uh, Dependa, you are from, share with us from the investor perspective. You see the ecosystem as well, especially technology development in different sectors. And what, what factors are pivotal, are the most important in driving up the EV development? Sure, uh, thank you. So we are based in Silicon Valley and have been investing in this space uh, for a while. Uh, we started investing in electric mobility about 15 years ago, uh, and uh, we were one of the first outside investors in Tesla, and at that time, uh -huh. we also invested in about uh, seven electric car type of companies, whether it was batteries or cars themselves. Um, so we've had a good dozen years or so uh, thinking about this and, and, and working on it, uh, some, some fun things, some, some uh, struggles. Um, over, over the last five, seven years, I think it has become very clear to the world uh, why this makes sense. Fifteen years ago, people used to look at us like we were crazy. Why would you ever take on it? And we were all engineers, and we were all coming from the semiconductor industry, and we were all coming from the electronics industry. And it made no sense for us for mobility not to become electrified. Just the math, the physics, the, the, the simple economics, the, the first principles made complete sense. And, and it was just a matter of time. So it was a, it was a question of uh, when, not if. And uh, you know, I think now we are here. I can't go uh, to a major airport in China without seeing big commercials for electric vehicles, which is amazing. Like, this is obviously going to be one of the regions. So our focus area has been cars, uh, and then since then, uh, electric airplanes. Uh, we have invested in a few electric airplane technologies, primarily around vertical takeoff and landing, and uh, to be able to do high congestion type of areas. So everything we were complaining about this morning, uh, our hope is that one of these companies will turn that one and a half hour uh, drive into five minutes uh, uh, so that that last mile and the everyday mile can be addressed. And I think that is right around the corner. Uh, this is not, it's not a stunt. Yes, there are many companies that are, that are building it more like a stunt or, or, or something that is uh, very conceptual, but uh, it is again similar to that aha moment in electric vehicles uh, 12 years ago. At this point, the math and the physics and and the fundamental first principles add up where we can do electric uh, uh, aviation as well, uh, primarily for short haul and high congestion type of markets. And then to pull it all together, you mentioned business models. We're looking at a variety of business models, different ways of bringing electric mobility um, out to people. From a technology point of view, I think batteries remain the big, uh, the big challenge and the big opportunity. Um, mm -hmm. 
We are thrilled that there has been a lot of work uh, around the world, including China, on very important incremental improvements where batteries have been improving 10, 20, 30 percent. I remember when we first started in electric vehicles, it used to be roughly $1,200 a kilowatt hour. You know, now uh, everybody's talking $100 a kilowatt hour or less. That curve has come down even faster than Moore's <laughs> law for solar. Everybody was amazed about solar, but if you look at the, the, the price performance improvement in batteries from 2011 to 18, it's even more dramatic than it was for solar, mm -hmm. which is an amazing story for this space. However, I think what we see now is the next phase, which is uh, solid state batteries coming to reality. People have been working on those for many years. Uh, many of you may have seen the press release from Volkswagen. Uh, they did with one of our portfolio companies which is building the next first factory of solid state batteries. Solid state batteries have been this long promised uh, uh, product and we think they will be the next big step change uh, uh, in, in all elements of, of, of storage, whether it's power density or energy density or cycle life or safety or cost. And if you can address those, it takes it into a whole different level. And then in areas like uh, power electronics, et cetera, we see a lot of interesting stuff happening. New materials like gallium nitride, et cetera, that will make uh, motors better, faster, cheaper. They'll make wireless charging easier. They'll make form factors smaller. So all of a sudden, to your question about ecosystem, now that people are no longer stepping back and saying, huh, do we only have golf carts? Uh, the whole ecosystem is stepping up. And we are seeing a lot of innovation happening in the space. And, and you'll be seeing uh, big jumps in solid state batteries. You'll be seeing big jumps in power electronics materials. And you'll see very exciting things and business models as more and more people come into the space. Very exciting. Oh, just a reminder to our audience, we meant to have a very uh, interactive session, so don't hesitate to raise your hand and jump in. If you have a question, we should um, make use of the time we have uh, with, our, with our guests. So I will start quickly with one question and probably open up, through the, uh, open up to, the, to, to the floor. Um, we're talking about scaling up today, and the opposite of scaling up is actually segmented, and the segmented one um, concern of that is segmented policy. And uh, Francois talked about China has a unified market, but, uni but China has a lot of local interests, a lot of players in that. And uh, one story, Taishin Carver 2014, is one of the early Tesla buyer, a businessman, mm -hmm. actually bought 20 charger and installed that on the way so he can finally drive cross country and he made a map of it. So whoever wants to do exactly the same, know where to charge the Tesla. Where are we now, four years later? How segmented is that and how to solve that segmented problem? A talk uh, even the uh, electric vehicle is a new field for the for innovation, and just now we have different ideas and we have new innovations. I think you talk about in the past time we beginning with the, tra uh, the uh, a public transfer, uh, that means. Uh, we promote first uh, extra bus and the cars, and then we talk about the share, share cars, car sharing. This is a new model. I think if we have more car, share car, cars as a car sharing, and the, 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 the traffic will, will be more better. Mm -hmm. We have the innovation just now in the different uh, uh, fine market, uh, like uh, Tesla, like uh, uh, Weilai, and more new companies. I hope you have the new companies. <laughs> you uh, support the new companies, that they go uh, over, over level, and the uh, um, bigger and the high class cars. And now we have the consumer. I think we have the consumer for this area. Reno is the one of the pioneer in this direction. I talk about the 2002. I have visited the first production line for your in your company, and I think that the next pioneer is Mr. Bradford. He is responsible for the A8. I have visited the. Uh, a, a planting of A3 in Leibniz. 
with the total revolution is not only the, the power system and the production system totally changed. The different motor, I, I will remember you, uh, the, we call the uh, battery for electric vehicle, they have two life cycles. The first life cycle is in the car, the second life, life cycle is out the car. You can see as, uh, uh, as uh, any storage, and no, you save a lot of money. No? You can use more time. And, uh, um, but I think always uh, it's uh, in the future we know we cannot say which one new innovation coming. Uh, I hope your investor give more attention in this direction. I think a lot of young people, they will come they will have with his uh, idea and to solve the problem of the total man mankind, energy saving, pollution reduce, and drive the innovation of the car, car manufacturing. So the solution is <coughs> innovation. <laughs> Anybody want to jump yeah. in? Maybe I should add a, a couple of points to, to Mr. Wang's comments. Mm -hmm. uh, first, uh, talking about the segmentation. Uh, Right now, our power story, we are not focused on the passenger car because the passenger car is so local and very uh, the fragment. We are focused on two segments. One is a logistic car, the trans city transportation, right? Deliver your food, your accessory. Normally, they happen overnight, okay? We believe every city, eventually, they are licensed. They will make it the logistic car transportation into the electric vehicle. Right now, in China, total, they have 24 million logistic car, global China, okay? Uh, but the EV is only less than 1%, okay? You can imagine, we, so that segment we are talking, it's frequent charge and also the value dynamic. That's one segment. Second segment we are uh, provide power solution is a heavy duty truck, particularly for the coal. You can imagine when you, for the coal miner, from the miner to the, Piling stations typically is 75 to 100 kilometers. Okay, so one way they need one charge. So that's our solution. Is so the the power suckers then it's it's frequent stop. That's the two segment we are. You can imagine in China totally they have 1.5 million heavy duty truck just shuttle between the miner and to the pilot station. So that's two segment we are we are looking at. We are not. Second, uh, to Mr. Wang's point about storage, can you imagine the number one storage provider globally is Tesla, right now. Mm -hmm. If you look at the energy stations built for the, for the, for the grid, is Tesla. Tesla is everywhere. So why, for the EV to get into energy storage, we are competing with Tesla every time, because we are just betting what's the cost of the recycle of the retired battery, right, as, 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 as you said. Because I was in solar business before. I was a SunTech and now GCI, we are largest solar company. The evolution of the battery cost is even more faster and than the solar evolution. 10 years today versus 10 years ago, solar total cost is only 10%. Yeah. One dollar today is 10 cents. That's why the grid parity is coming. But the, we saw the battery cost curve even more dramatic. That's why I said at the beginning, I made it clear. I don't want to get in the battery manufacturer business. It's really scary. Huh? But storage, Tesla right now is really number one. That's, that's how they created the so dynamic cycle, not just for the second minute, but also for, like Mr. Wang said, after the car, what are you going to do? In, in the car, it's easier, but after the car, yeah. that's, that's the problem I think the industry needs to resolve. Needs to, needs to resolve. Thank you. Uh, he's jumping. I think uh, what is really exciting about this phenomenon that you just described is that I think we've all sort of seen what happened, what's happened in solar. And it's a beautiful thing, right, what's happened in solar in terms of cost curves, price performance, speed with which it has gone. In batteries, we have fundamentally not changed the way we've been making electrochemical batteries in a very long time. Mm -hmm. And so unlike solar, where we got to a semiconductor sort of approach 
you know, 30 years ago in Bell Labs or 40 years ago when 50s actually was the early one. But the, this, the story of the last 10, 15 years has been about taking a semiconductor material and improving that. Mm -hmm. That leap was already made. In batteries, that leap has not been made. So this phenomenal improvement story that everybody is talking about over the last 10 years has been on an old technology platform, which is amazing because we need it. As you said, Tesla has become the largest provider, and we know how small a percentage of cars globally that is. What we're going to see now, which is why it is so exciting, is the shift from the old electrochemical packaging approach to these new solid state approaches. And that is going to be like going from the vacuum tube to the transistor in the semiconductor world, which unlocked that, that whole approach. And while that was aimed at one application before, this type of storage is going to impact everything. It's going to impact electrification of vehicles. It's going to impact electrification of the grid, I mean, in terms of uh, storage of the grid. It's going to impact uh, the, the storage of consumer electronics. It's going to impact how people view storage in their homes because the price performance is going to come down and the form factors are going to come down. So I think we're, we're now going to see the, that next phase, which we didn't need to in solar. So to me, the, that innovation curve in storage is even going to be more exciting than we have in solar, and it is right around the corner. Well, the eve of more revolution, basically. Yes, and, and, and the, um, the number of degrees of freedom it is going to open up for us to be able to do electrification of, of things like transportation is going to be nonlinear because of that, because it will give us a lot of freedom in terms of options, sizes, price, performance, cost, etc. This might be even one of the biggest challenges for the traditional car companies because they look at electric and connected cars in the same way they looked at combustion engine cars for the last 100 years. So this means they say uh, the components has to last forever. So the battery they talk about should be give guarantee 8 or 10 or 12 years for the, for the, for the battery. Uh, they talk about range, so a car has to have at least 500, 600 kilometers of range. But if you look to it from a different perspective, and I think all was said here, then you don't need it. You just, just don't need it. It's, it's nonsense to discuss if you should give 10 years of guarantee for a battery, because it will be old after three or four years. It will be old. So you have to think about it as a replaceable part. You can take it out, put it into a second life cycle, minimize the different cost, provide your customer an update. Yeah, not only software, and a battery update. It's very difficult to think towards this direction for a traditional car maker, but this is what you have to do. The range discussion, uh, if you talk about urban mobility, why do you need 500 kilometers of range? Complete nonsense. The only thing you have to do is you have to provide a charging infrastructure, a charging network where you have to access to it and where charging is fast. You cannot wait for two hours, but if you, if you can do it in 20 minutes, it's all good. So my prediction is if cost comes down, and it, it's dramatically coming down, this will not result into bigger batteries and more range into the cars. We will use this cost performance to reduce even the size of, of batteries and to bring the cost down and mm -hmm. eventually make those cars competitive. And this is a new kind of thinking you need uh, to be successful in this area. How about Francois? Mm -hmm. Because just, just now, Karsten uh, made a very interesting point that there's a mindset change for the traditional car makers. Do you experience the mindset change as well? And where do you see the major cost uh, revolution comes from? Yes, it's true that this is a big change, and it's quite exciting to have a new uh, new company um, challenging uh, challenging us. Uh, if we take the example of the battery ranch, uh, at the end of the day, we have a customer, so we have to convince the customer. And if we take the, the case of China, with let's say all the regulation, maybe 10% of the market can be electric cars. If we want to reach 25%, which is the goal, uh, or over 20% by, by 2025, we have to convince a, a large range of customers. And I see uh, three main usage. Uh, first one is all uh, about uh, car sharing, taxi, uh, and so on. Uh, and this is the most efficient because um, uh, a way to reduce the traffic, a way to maximize the efficiency of the government subsidies, and also a way to spread uh, electric car experience. Um, with a private car, maybe 50 person will enjoy the car a year. With a taxi, 2,000, 3,000. Then you can spread 
what yeah. is electric car and convince the customer that they can buy an electric car. So all what is about, let's say, car sharing, taxi, is really one big segment uh, in, in the coming years. Then, um, if I take the example of China, all the big, uh, big cities or big tier one cities, uh, here I think that customers uh, demand a big range of, of battery. Uh, and at least a minimum of 500 kilometers. And in the next uh, five years, the, the big challenge for automakers, either old style, but maybe also for you, is uh, uh, to be able to, to increase the efficiency of the battery, the range, and so on, and to reduce the cost at the same time. And frankly speaking, for this, I cannot say we have full visibility about this. Uh, and, and the third one, uh, to reach uh, over 20% of the market with EVs in China by 2025 is affordable electric cars. So, which will allow a lot of new customers to buy a first car, but this car will not be IC, but this car will be an electric car. And, and for this as well, we think uh, China will be uh, much ahead, and it's why uh, on, on, on Renault side and Renault, Nissan, Mitsubishi, Alliance side, we, we invest the full scope um, uh, f focusing on, on car sharing, for instance, with partnership with DD in China, focusing on uh, 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 electric cars for, for big cities, and, and once again, we think we, we should provide more than 500 kilometers <laughs> uh, range autonomy, and also affordable electric cars developed in China for China. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, you have a question? I think, I think there's one really important point to bridge this, which is the things that you were talking about, we need to make sure that they're not done because there is no alternative. If his customer wants 500 kilometers, we should be prepared to give his customer 2,000 kilometers if they want it, without any compromise. Mm -hmm. And I would say, you know, if you think of this, it would have sounded absurd if 10 years ago we were sitting in this panel and we said, you know what the consumer needs? They need a supercomputer that is more powerful than any supercomputer built and everyone on the planet needs it in their pocket. It would have been absurd. People would have said, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. However, what they said, what they were saying was, you want to be able to give as much power, as much price performance to every consumer that wants it without compromise. And then beautiful things will happen. So as a result of it, we all have a supercomputer in our pocket that nobody said needed to be there, but it's unlocking a whole bunch of stuff that is possible. And I see, you know, Mobility the same way, that if, if the car company's customers today say, I will not buy an electric car till I have 1,000 kilometers, it's possible now. It's going to be possible. Whether they need that or not, consumers will decide, car companies will decide. But the good news is we are now on the cusp of where cars, electric cars will have a 1,000-mile range without mm -hmm. any compromise. Electric cars will be the cheapest cars to drive in that category without any compromise. Electric cars will be the best performance cars without any compromise. Whether it's overpowered, over range, or et cetera, depends on whoever wants to decide. But it, they will not be underpowered and under range because they have to be. It'll be a product decision, and that's a beautiful thing. I completely agree that just to, to avoid misunderstandings, what customers want today is they would love to have 800 or 1,000 kilometers. My point is this will, I'm deeply convinced this will change very fast when they start to experience it. Uh, and uh, this is about what you said. And I give you, can give you two examples. One is I, I drive a Tesla, Tesla Model X in California. Uh -huh. It has uh, 450 kilometers of range or something like that. And, and everybody from my family and my friends said, I never would buy such a car because the range is too low and blah, blah, blah. <laughs> After trying it, yeah, it's the most wanted car, uh, and everybody wants to have it. I have to rent it out all the time. <laughs> no, it's, it's really true, because driving in the, in the Bay Area, you never, never need 450 kilometers. You don't yeah. need it. You yeah. just don't need it. Yeah. And if you drive down to Los Angeles, you anyway will have to recharge, even, even your combustion engine's car. So you go to one of the superchargers, plug it in for 10 minutes, and 10 minutes will give you what, what is needed to arrive Los Angeles. So everybody says it's cool, it's, it's cool yeah? <laughs> no, nobody saw it before, but after experiences, everybody says it's cool. What we do at Byton, our first car coming to the market end of next year will have two battery options. A very small, or not very a small one, giving you 400 kilometers of range and a mm. very competitive price position. Mm. 
And there will be a big one, 520 or 530 kilometers of range. You have to pay for it. I will be very interested. Will be very interested to see how customers react on it and how they choose those options and how this will change over over time. Yeah, but you'll take away the excuse. No more excuse. No, no more excuse. You can have what you want. Customers yeah, we have the challenge. I I think uh, the biggest challenge for the innovation is the change and the biggest biggest. Uh, opportunities too. For the car maker, we must know what the customer needs. Some customer need customer need that in drive in the city. Another needs perhaps uh, between the cities or the logistic traffic or uh, uh, big trucks. In the future, we must fill in this uh, meeting on the fuel cell, and that is uh, the future the direction. And now, and just now, we must go to promote electric vehicle, I think, not only for the personal private cars, and for the sharing cars, for public uses, for the, uh, always, uh, for the broadband needs, and uh, to reduce the traffic in the big city. That is the one of, uh, for the po uh, progress of a technology, um, my uh, observation is that since last eight years, every five years, the enhanced energy density of double and reduce the price of the half. So this end, this uh, uh, 2000, 20, we will come of the targets what are the, with, with the same cost, like a truck, uh, uh, traditional vehicles, and produce electric vehicles. And that is uh, <coughs> our, our future. I think uh, everybody, for the customer, for the manufacturer, for the investor, must face the change. And that is uh, our big challenge and big opportunity. Exactly. Um, <laughs> we're slightly running out of time, but we want to take at least two questions from the audience. because it's <laughs> Okay, we have the gentleman on the front row. Can somebody help me with the mic? Please identify yourself and keep the question short. Wow, very, very, exciting, very exciting talk. I, I'm from Biosales. Actually, we are a startup company uh, uh, related to the wireless communication. Uh -huh. But uh, we, my question, I have two questions. One, uh, two, to unlock two directions, maybe related to vehicle. The first one is maybe maybe Mr. One, maybe purple. We, as we know, that five G is how say is is going to our life to in, in China very soon, and there is a how say, connect, connected car and direction. So, uh, what do you think that uh, the how the five uh, whether the five G is needed in, is needed to. Uh, to connect all the vehicles and to enable them to be automatic, and the first question, and when when it will come to our, to our lives, and the second question maybe for the companies guys, maybe especially for the Mr. CEO of the uh, Python, uh, is that that uh, the wireless charging? As we know that if we uh, uh, if we charge, uh, if we use our EV, we have to uh, how say come come down to the vehicle and to charge. And uh, if the, if the so if the battery is going out, we, we can we cannot uh, uh, um, if there's nobody help, then the vehicle cannot charge. So that's so uh, my second question is that uh, whether what, what do you think of the wireless, uh, the future of the wireless charging to the vehicle? Thank you. Okay, five G and wireless charging. Maybe we take another question and we ask them together. Please, the gentleman there. Oh, I'm yep. sorry, the, uh, right here. the over here. Um, Jeremy Warner from the uh, Daily Telegraph in London. At the height of the auto boom in the States, there were, were literally thousands of uh, new entrants and companies. Um, and I guess the same sort of phenomenon, thousands but lots of new companies are being spawned by EVs. Um, do you expect the same process of consolidation as occurred in traditional auto to envelop this industry, and will the present incumbents in auto come to to dominate, or will these new entrants uh, survive and prosper? Okay. 
So 5G wireless charging consolidation. Let's start with probably uh, Mr. Wan on 5G and connectivity. Mm. Well, please give me some time. Maybe they can answer the other questions first. Okay. <laughs> my, my professional life is starting from the TV set, now the solar, right? Now it's, a, now it's getting the mobile. Look at the TV. When I started my TV, it was over 1,000 companies. I met the chairman of TCL last night. Now it's only less than 18 companies that does the TV set globally. And you look, look at the segment. Every, every single of the segment is very consolidated. There's the display, electronic part, and the distribution. Then when you started the solar businesses over a thousand companies, if you look at the solar company, the major player, no more than 20. I believe five years from now, I can, you, can, you can recall no more than 10 companies for the solar industry, okay? Everyone, see, everyone is, a, is a segment and provide total solutions. For, I, I believe it's the same for the EV. Like, as, that's, my, that's my point. Ev eventually, there's a platform to manage the EV, manage the transportation. There's a platform to how to make the car, and the platform how to do the power total solutions. Now, three major categories, that's essential of the entire eco cycle. Make the car and uh, control the battery. The car and the battery should be separate. Then how do you provide a platform to manage the car and manage the smart city. I think that's, so I think consolidation is definitely, yeah. Consolidation, standardize, and efficiency, I think that's, that's the trend, that's, that's my. Consolidation is I think uh, from a disruption point of view, this is not any different than most of the other technology disruptions that have happened. And, uh, and I would just say that, you know, if you look at the history about 20 years ago when a couple of car companies, large companies, did electric vehicles. It was because legislation and governments and people, you know, they, they, they were forced to go there and they viewed it as a tax and they viewed it as something that they had to do to do their business. It was not because they viewed it as an innovative next way of doing things. And so as long as that mindset exists, you're going to see new entrants coming in and doing the real innovation, right? The new innovation has not happened from within, which is not unique to the auto industry. I think it happened in almost every industry. Very hard for the emperors to, to, to do their own revolutions. And so it hasn't happened. So I would say uh, right now you're seeing only the beginnings of those disruptive things. Uh, it is great to see the large companies uh, join and introduce those things because we need to solve this problem very quickly. We can't do this 10,000 cars at a time. We need to do this 10 million cars at a time. And so uh, it's looking good in the way bo bo both are doing it, but there's going to be a huge amount of innovation that comes from the outside. It's not coming from the inside anytime soon. François, do you agree Emperor cannot uh, have its own revolution? <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, uh, I, I agree that uh, we'll have a consolidation, for sure. And for, let's say, traditional OEM to have... Uh, uh, new competitors is quite good. It's quite good. And at the end of the day, um, as you said, we have uh, to, uh, to ramp up uh, EVs uh, very quickly, uh, many challenges. So uh, to have new uh, actors, new players, I think it's good. One, I want to expand the some answer of your question. Connecting is on a bright vantage question. The first connecting for the Electric, the user of electric cars. There's a connection to environment, according to the char char uh, charging station. And so I think that is uh, no big problem. But for the, but for the uh, uh, develop of uh, 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 automotive industry, the connection is a bright band. The connection between the manufacturer connected <coughs> to the investor, between the energy provider, connecting pro, uh, between the customer and the market, ma manufacturer. Like you said, uh, how long range is you need? That is a big that's a, a question. You, you, you can get your uh, <laughs> answer only by user and different. <laughs> And that is uh, uh, the next connection, the connection for the 
new and traditional car makers. And there's a different design uh, and uh, different markets. And if we talk for the next phase, automatic drive, car to car, mm. that is a big challenge, but they give more safety. Mm. Uh, this is uh, our, the always uh, connection between countries, uh, Chinese, European, Japan, and the different countries, to make the same, same plug for charge. Yeah, <laughs> that is, uh, is, uh, is bigger. You, need a, you think it's easy, but it's a very difficult thing. Yeah? <laughs> we need connections. We need connectivity all the world. And so we need the public open. We need the open, uh, opening up uh, policy on go far, on go the, in the future. Yeah. Maybe one guest very quickly answer the wireless charging question, and then we probably have to wrap up. Who will take it, Karsten? Let me add one comment to this discussion here, because it's very interestingly, interesting. All these new things with uh, connected cars, smart and autonomous, are all linked to electric car discussion. And you could ask why. Because you can build autonomous cars and smart cars on ICE base mm -hmm. as well if you want. But it is linked because um, the reason that new companies can come in, new players can come in, is that building electric cars is so much easier than combustion engine cars. So the hurdle for new players to come in is very low now. And this is the reason why we will have this disruption, because we, new parties are coming into to the game, and this is the exciting thing. With respect to charging, um, I think we have to see it to, to differentiate between home charging and public charging. Uh, uh, the uh, inductive, inductive, inductive charging is interesting technology. It's a bit slower than if you put in a big cable. Uh, I, see it, uh, I think it will happen on the, on the home charging uh, point. It will be, for the foreseeable time, not so, not so attractive for public charging because there you need speed. <laughs> what could be of interest, and this is a long-term uh, uh, perspective, one of the problems we have to deal with with smart uh, uh, autonomous cars is we, ha want to, we have to operate them in environments today which were built uh, for combustion engine cars, uh, for traditional cars for the last 100 years. If you think about, and, and these things are going on in China, if you, think, if you would think about designing new cities from scratch, in, 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 in a way that you create a smart city approach, design a smart city, yeah. then you can think about complete different things. And those <coughs> cities would look very different. And in this aspect, you could build wireless charging uh, within streets, for example, or at traffic lights, or whatever kind of, of, of intersection. So if you think about creating a complete new ecosystem, then this can, be a, can become a very interesting technology, which will take some time. From a technology point of view, there have been many new innovations in the last 10 years, mm -hmm. which are going to make the pulling together of everything that's needed for making cheap wireless charging possible. And that is not happening just for wireless charging, but it's the innovation that you're seeing in motors, innovation that you're seeing in solar inverters, innovation that you're seeing in wind turbines, all of those drivers of cheaper power electronics, high frequency switching, even the consumer electronics are all going to add to the things that are needed to make wireless charging cheaper. So I think, again, it'll be one of those things where it will become simple and easy and people will choose to say, do I want a wireless charger or do I want to have a plug-in charger or whatever? It's not going to be difficult to do just because there isn't a solution. The solution will be there. It'll be your choice whether you want it or not. Thank you so much. I'm sure you, enjoying the, uh, you all enjoyed the discussion as much as I do. We have broad picture policy discussions. We have a lot of uh, innovation technology uh, points as well. Please join me in giving a big round of applause to our wonderful guests, and thank you for your insights today. <laughs>